Okay, well, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. It's such a pleasure to see everyone. Um, I actually missed everyone. Uh, this has been the most bizarre and interesting and fascinating year. Um, thank you for joining me this afternoon as we reflect on um, teaching international trade law for the John H. Jackson Moot Court Competition for 2020. You'll see that these are the participants. We had Haley Camilla Waring, Ashley Blunt and Keenan Johnson. They were the actual team members. I was the primary coach and we had uh, Stuart Bentley, who is an Elsa or John H. Jackson alum. It's part of the alumni program that I started for the competition. And I'm proud to say that Camilla Waring um, actually won the best orator award uh, in Africa this year for Rhodes University. So what I want to discuss today is the issue of, you know, well, what is John H. Jackson and what is the Moot Court competition all about? And then what the impact of going virtual um, has been. And then the fact that we actually, as a consequence, you know, found fresh and new ideas, most of which um, said that, well, quite frankly, I have to be a hell of a lot more flexible in my teaching practice. But it gave me an opportunity to actually align teaching and learning with my assessment. So I actually found great opportunity in the experience in negotiating the curriculum. So for starters, just as a, um, you know, a launch pad, if you see um, the diagram on the top right hand side of your screen, you'll see there that everything green represents the countries that are fully membered states of the WTO. So that's more than about 164 countries. The ones in red are non-member states and the ones in blue are members of the European Union. And the others in the yellowish color on your screen are basically observer member status or those that actually might become members or moving towards becoming members. So the conversation is actually a truly global one. So when we speak about John X. Jackson, it's actually founded, it was started in 2002. So this year we're actually entering the 19th competition, would you believe? Um, and Rhodes has been an integral part for the majority of part of that. And um, actually has this um, established itself um, as a very strong competitor quite um, globally within the WTO um, and all the other universities. To give you an idea just how large and how complex the scale of this endeavor actually is. Um, it actually takes place um, well in six regional rounds. So that's basically two rounds in Europe. We have the North America, the South America, we have Africa and Pan Pacific Asia. And we start off with over 500 students and eventually it whittles down to the top 20 in the final round. And to give you a sense of where Rhodes fits and has done since it's really participating with the, the competition is that we either are definitely within the top four on the continent of Africa, if not number one, and we have made it to um, the preliminary rounds just shy of the semifinals in the final rounds in Geneva. So there's always quite a lot at stake in this competition from our perspective. So um, you'll see the acronym is JHJMCC. Please remember that MCC is actually gonna be important in this conversation a little bit later. So when it starts, I often have to deal with students that have never dealt with trade before. So for me, and I used this before in the, uh, with Catalyst as to illustrate this point, is that it helps to contextualize the problem. So if we look at something like the idea of a product like tuna, I always ask the students, well, is tuna tuna? And how do you, what do you think of when you go shopping for this particular product? Is it just the fact that you want sustenance? Is it because of price? Is it because you need protein? And then we start looking at the issues of consumer patterns, um, global consumption, tastes and habits. Um, and then we ask them to say, well, how do you internalize what you do and whether or not what you do actually matters? And then we bring that home to technical barriers to trade, which is linking the theory and critique. So if we take it a little bit further, we then say that, and I mean, I'm sure that you may have recognized the idea of the dolphin safe program or dolphin safe labels. So many people will be happy to say that they will maybe eat tuna, but they certainly don't like the idea of eating tuna with dolphins in it. If you then take it one step further, there may be a broader social justice 
question in the sense that, well, how many people can actually afford to make that decision, particularly when these foods, um, especially if you want to eat healthily or better or right, depending on which term you want to use, often means that it, you have to pay more. And that brings us home directly to the case law. And if people still haven't quite bought into this, I often use the palm oil example. So then this slide becomes quite useful. And if you take a few minutes to have a look at this slide, you'll then see that there are various products that become quite uh, familiar. Everything from perhaps Wrigley's or Kellogg's to Coca-Cola and Nestle and Johnson and & Johnson. And within that, I'm sure you will find that there are certain products that you actually personally use. You might be, you know, enjoying Lay's as chips, or you might enjoy chocolate through Nestle, or you may be using Vichy or Olay or Ralph Lauren, um, various Kellogg's products. Now, what does that mean? That means that we collectively actually all contribute to the following. And this is where it really becomes quite disturbing, that we've actually collectively actually through our unconscious behavior contributed to the destruction of natural vegetation in particular areas like Sumatra and Borneo. And at first you feel very removed from that, but it becomes something quite real when you realize that palm oil is pretty much found in almost 50% of all supermarket foods. And that by continuing to use it, we all contribute to over 50,000 orangutans that have died because of deforestation, not to mention the carbon emissions, which are actually um, on the increase because of the methods of deforestation that is currently being used. And the reason why this is so important is because the JHAMCC also speaks to the Sustainable Development Goals. So part and parcel of this is not just pure legal thinking or your traditional views around um, a fictional case with teams around respondents and complainants states, but we also have to address issues that may touch on anything from poverty and uh, matters of gender inequality to issues around what is below and above the sea and even climate change. What is interesting is that this competition normally takes in terms of preparation roughly around 12 months. And that's because we're taking traditionally LB students from Rhodes who then compete in Kenya in the African rounds. And then if they make it into the top four, then they compete in the final rounds in Switzerland. Interestingly enough, the topic which has just been released for 2020, 2021 is Boudicca, measures relating to the importation and marketing of nutrition food bars which actually really deals with the issue of global obesity and the pandemic related to that, particularly relating to the marketing of food as nutrition bars. So it actually forces you out of your comfort zone. And in fact, it doesn't become a purely legal problem. It becomes legal, economic, social, and in this instance, even a chemical problem. So we have to partner with various other departments within the university to help extrapolate and unpack the legal problem. So our law students are exposed to various different types of thinking and schools of thought. So the selection team and the process is quite onerous in itself. And this is when everything happens smoothly. There's an internal selection process. So I'm already underway with that. And I have to select students from the LLB penultimate year. In other words, this is their first year of LLB because I need students who are still in their final year who are going to compete in 2021. And then I have to give them a bit of much of a crash course between two and four students about international trade law in its totality, and then relate that to the actual case, which was already launched on the 15th of September. And now look at the timeframes. We then have clarification questions, which have to be submitted by the 15th of November. And then we have to work throughout December to work on the heads of argument, which has to be submitted by midnight in Geneva on the 10th of January, 2021. The team then has to be ready to present oral submissions, either in Kenya in person, but more than likely virtually in May, 2021. And at this point, I need to emphasize that 
this is definitely one of those competitions that is not a sprint. This is definitely a marathon. And the type of students that are selected need to have strong research capability. They need to have strong critical thinking abilities, but also they need to possess abilities to move between oral arguments. So it's quite a well-rounded student or students that you're looking for. So in the normal scenario, it means actually interviewing students based on their oral, sorry, based on their written submissions. If you make it to the top four, you then present your oral submissions in the final round in Switzerland, July 2021. Now, what would the benefits of this competition be and what makes it so different? Well, for me, the easy and straightforward and the most glaring point is that this is the epitome of praxis. I teach students about the dispute settlement understanding, which is the DSU, which is about, um, in effect, our civil procedure at an international or a multilateral level, how to deal with and actually materially um, address issues of disputes before an international panel at the World Trade Organization. So this goes well beyond the theory. So that we take the academic principles and we have to apply the civil procedure element as well as the covered agreements, as well as case law. Now at this point, we're already taking them further out of their element because in South Africa, we have the principle of stare decisis. In other words, the principle of precedent that higher courts making decisions therefore impact lower courts, which have to follow those decisions. And that's pretty much turned on its head internationally, whereas this now lies very much on the interpretation and the reading and the wording of the covered agreements themselves. And the panel is actually the most important feature in terms of how one addresses and deals with this in that particular moment. So all the other cases are of persuasive value. Here, through this particular project and this particular program, the students as well as the coaches or lecturers actually get to meet the true panelists and the ambassadors and the experts who have crafted the legislation and the theory that the students actually study. So it becomes a truly global training and recruitment exercise. And I'm proud to actually say that not only have we had several successful students from Rhodes who are, have won various projects, such as internships at um, international um, firms in Brussels um, to master's projects all over the world, but one of our uh, Zimbabwean students um, in Kimberley, near Jeka, in 2016 was awarded a full master's uh, scholarship. She's completed her master's program and is now working at the World Trade Organization in the Legal Affairs Division. So this really closes the circle between LLB all the way through into a, a profession. So how has this impacted me in my teaching and my practice? Well, with the advent of um, COVID-19, we were forced to address matters of alternative methods of assessment. And in the law faculty, that sends shivers down our spine, to be honest. And it became apparent that linking and working with the DSU and the case study was a natural synergy. So what I did was I created and crafted a fictitious case, released it to students on a Monday at 11 o'clock, then gave them 24 hours to ask clarifications to be given to me by 11 the next day. And this also speaks to the process that is part and parcel of our civil procedure, even in South Africa, where you have an opportunity to be able to clarify matters before you actually then appear in court or have a particular hearing. So this is echoing what people have to do in a real world scenario. I then also agreed that I would submit a video response to said questions by two o'clock on the same day, and then give them the rest of the week to argue in a written submission on behalf of the complainant state by close of business on the Friday. So my question was, how do I empower these students, my students under COVID-19? So the key thing was to make the assessment fit for purpose and to also clearly express what was even beyond simply the learning outcomes. That wasn't sufficient in this particular instance. It had to be made very clear 
what particular structure was going to be most appropriate for them and negotiate what the expectations both of staff and students would be in this particular scenario. Because it, I had to be sensitive, not only to the impact of COVID-19, but also realized that I had to be far more accessible in terms of being able to not just comfort people in terms of the nervousness that would normally take place because I'm not physically present, but also because of the expectations being so different because law students were not necessarily used to the idea of an alternative method of assessment. So is it such an alternative, I ask myself, and I don't really think so. In this scenario, I did decide on a fictional case. I did decide that it had to be before the dispute settlement body, following those particular rules. And I uh, created a, almost a role play scenario, at least only for the written part, before a mythical panel, which would be me. So in other words, that created the golden thread between WTO law, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and very importantly for the project, not only critical thinking, but strategic thinking. Now, this is something we don't necessarily talk about in teaching. Um, if you're going to be a case, not all of your arguments are going to be of equal weight. There are going to be some quick wins, and then there are going to be some challenging, shall we say, harder to sell arguments. And some of which, quite frankly, would actually not swing in your favor. You're never going to get that perfect client. And part of it, or part of the assessment, was to be able to test whether or not students could identify those different aspects. So part of the assessment then required them to also to be able to say, well, I will argue X because I believe in Y, but I would also strategically say that I would be comfortable enough to be able to say that in this particular um, instance, because of the fact that the arguments are not in my favor, because they are patently um, in the opponent's um, favor, that I could actually offer an alternative argument. So strategically, they may have to concede certain points to actually win the argument overall. In this instance, I chose to create a fictitious scenario with a fictitious country called Valeria, which was trading in its famous or infamous dessert wine products made in a particular traditional method. And then the students had to act on behalf of a complainant state as legal counsel, campaigner, and supporting various claims of or allegations of a breach. And all claims then had to be supported by various articles of the GATT, relevant covered agreements, as well as case law. So that is traditional, that would be quite normal, that would be expected of any law student in under any other circumstance. What was different is that I then said, in terms of the process, how about a poll? What is the best method of communication? Would you like WhatsApp? Would you like to use this particular dedicated Facebook page? Is, are you connected sufficient or would you prefer email? Interestingly enough, law students at this stage being quite well trained as to matters around um, personal security and protecting their own personal information are loathe to enter into WhatsApp groups. Some of them loathe to enter into Facebook groups. So they are far more comfortable to send things either via Are You Connected or via one particular channel. But that was a negotiation between them. Then we had the clarification questions, again, aligned directly within the DSU. So that was echoed and had to be recorded. So once again, reinforcing the dispute settlement understanding that we covered in the first part of the first, uh, first semester. Then they had the opportunity to deal with the feedback questions. And of course, total of five days to deliver to the panel with the opportunity at the end that I had to be able to call on four random students to speak to the assessment in order to meet the validity requirement, giving them 24 hours notice. So how did we get through this? We personally had a bit of a, um, I suppose, a mantra. So for those of you who watch Schitt's Creek, um, 
our mantra was, well, if Moira Rose could live in that motel, then I can do this. And that's what we did. So from a normal scenario of having to meet in an office or the library, this was our team. This was how we met. This is how we met on average three hours per session. And the reason for this is because every single person that had to present did so before every other member. And then we had time to critically reflect on their particular submission. They would then have to take those notes and amendments and then revise their submission in order to do present for the next. So we would start with a complainant state. Each one would go in order. They would present, we would critique, we would question, we would throw up more ideas around what needs to be researched or possible gaps in the research, assign tasks, and then we would do the respondent state the next day, the same exercise. And when we went back, say two days later to come back with a complainant state, we would then supplement the information that we have learned having done the research over the past few days. And that's how we completely continued to evolve and also practice with the new media. Remember this particular competition is, as I said, a marathon. So if you had to take these three participants, that meant that in total, they would have to argue for say 45 minutes. They then as the complainants would have to stop the respondents would have to then start with their 45 minutes. One party who is responsible for the rebuttal would have to take notes while the other party is speaking. They then have an opportunity to rebut and then the respondents have an opportunity to rebut. At the end of that exercise, the panel then gives oral feedback, which means the entire exercise does take about two hours in a competition setting. So if you're in the competition, if you are pleading at nine o'clock in the morning, you would be the complainant, argument's sake. That means you, you would compete that day. Then you would be the respondent the next day. And then you would be told what time you compete. At the after that, you'd be told what you are, who you are competing against the next day. If you make it to the semifinals, you compete in the morning. If you can make it to the finals, you'll be told by lunchtime that you compete that afternoon. So it is quite a mentally taxing and exhausting and physically trying experience, but one that truly embeds this knowledge at a master's level. Also, because they have to be able to negotiate and move between oral arguments because like in any scenario, courtroom or otherwise, they, can, they are asked questions through the flow of the argument. It also means that they need to fully understand the argument of all the other panelists. So on the plus side, students are now proficient in the following. MS Teams, Cisco, WebEx, as well as Zoom. And this is increasingly being used in practice in motion court in South Africa. We found that Judges, magistrates, attorneys, advocates, all of them had to now actually start uh, giving their oral presentations, um, as it's speaking to their heads of argument using various platforms in South Africa, principally Zoom. Um, and this has actually opened up an entire new world um, to the way the legal profession will actually be practicing going forward. In fact, um, for those students who have not had the opportunity to practice in this particular forum, I would highly encourage them to do so going forward. So this is one of the things I think we should encourage as a faculty in terms of the preparation. So my suggestions for the course of going forward, having learned from this experience would be the following. And I really hope to have input on, on, on this from everyone in the, in the room, so to speak, is that I'd like to perhaps start the course with a complex case study, because in effect, this is actually almost a capstone. You need to understand the law of contract, you need to understand private international law, you need to be able to understand civil procedure, which they've done by now. And we're starting with something called international trade law, which has various branches in other arena. So, 
as students work with a complex case study, they're then taught the basics and then, then the complexities, and they're continuously mentored in groups, which will then argue either as both the complainant and or the respondent states, which means that is the critical reflection, meaning they have, they have to see both sides of the argument. But I want something more. I want to see not only their submission of the heads of argument for both parties, but I need to see not only the critical thinking, but the strategic thinking, which is required at that level. And that would be a completely different dimension. Ultimately, as the capstone to that particular course would be something akin to the argument as we do with the JHJMCC. I've spoken with various alumni and they've already offered their time and their services to this, where we could actually then have an oral component to that so that they could then present the oral submissions to the lecturer or the examiner, as well as perhaps an external as part of an essential component part of that particular course. And then we basically bring back and tie the circle all the way through so that they can see the evolution from the case study until that they actually have developed the skills as they would, as they would require to before the DSU. So um, I, one of the things I also added is, well, you know, this sounds terribly dry and terribly boring for some people at first glance, but it doesn't have to be. And I recommend the following. If you want to, um, and if you've ever thought, how on earth would one teach Brexit to a group of people that have never had Brexit before or never dealt with it before? My answer is, as always, Brexit yoga. I do, however, um, suggest that, you know, make sure you have a sense of humor. And I have used this as a teaching aid. And if you want to explain your, uh, the, uh, the concept of Brexit in under four minutes, this is a brilliant way to do it. The competition also then gives you a comprehensive uh, report, which is 60 pages long, which actually then even gives you the individual scores of all the various participants. And I've also included a link to the 2020-2021 case. Thank you for your time and the opportunity. Thank you very much, Shweb. That was so fascinating. Uh, colleagues, do you have any questions? Please feel free to take the mic or type in the text chat. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't have so many questions, but just to, to really um, say, Shweb, I think it's amazing what you did and then what you have learned from it. Um, and, and how that's going to impact on your practice going forward. And the whole authenticity of, of the assessment um, is, is just amazing. And I do think it's a capstone project because they're needing to draw knowledge from all over the place. It's not like just one little body of knowledge or set of outcomes. It, it, it comes from all over. Oh, and I love, the, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Lynn. I mean, do you think because this is um, something which I'm, I'm seriously considering taking forward as, as the way I want to teach it next year, um, is that, I mean, instead of a sit down exam, uh, a, or a traditional sit down exam, that this is a far more practical way of assessing, because this is quite literally what they have to do in practice. In fact, it's, it is what they have to do. What they have to do. So, uh, in fact, a traditional sit-down exam is almost too artificial and is not best placed in this instance. Absolutely, Shueb. I mean, I think that's the main point, is that you are thinking of making your assessment so much more authentic. Um, mm. And I suppose the only thing to think about is, uh, will you be able to prepare your students sufficiently for the, the kind of summative aspect of it? Um, mm, thank maybe you. that's just something you need to think about. You can't just pounce them, you know, pounce it on them. There has to be, as you know, scaffolding and preparation. Mm. But I'm sure you've well, thought that, of that. Yeah, that's why I start off with the DSU and I start off with the civil procedure element. Um, and where, because um, there are normally um, alumni who are, are here doing master's programs and the like, and I can partner them with um, Rhodes alum who have done this, that they then actually can assist the smaller groups 
in building them with the expertise on how to actually negotiate dealing with the oral argument element. I think the idea of, of partnering with alumni is really great. I mean, that's, that, that's kind of peer learning, just a little bit more experienced peers. But I think that will be really useful. But um, a question that Nicola is just asking, which is what I also wondered about, is the scaling up. So how can you use this process with a larger number of students? Sorry, Nicola, I just took your question. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> um, so well. No, <laughs> um, I have I have been thinking about that because I mean that's one of the big things is that it's so easy. It's easier to work with smaller groups of people, and it is a truly labor-intensive exercise for this competition at that particular level particularly because they are dealing with the very panelists. These are the people who actually, you know, negotiated the Marrakesh agreement. Um, they, these are the people who are in the room. Um, but uh, what I have done is I've spoken to colleagues of mine who are in Switzerland. These are the people that train the, the lawyers for um, uh, developing and least developed countries. And they as well as my colleagues in Ecuador. And they have already, worked with us on training some other students. So they, there are people who are, so we can use um, Cisco WebEx and other platforms to continuously actually train students um, using multimedia. Um, so what's interesting about this is that then students can see recorded videos, they can watch it at their own time, they can participate a little bit later. They don't have to participate in the massive sessions. So that can be broken down. What I've done for another class just this morning is when students have asked me uh, a particular question about a particular topic, but I find students particularly are afraid to use forums. I was chatting to Nicola about this morning. Mm -hmm. So they will ask a question, but then I create a specific little video about how to unpack that. So this morning I found that uh, it was about the solvency liquidity test in company law. But what I find is that I think the root of the problem is that because these are not law students, no one has taught them how to interpret or how to, um, how to read statutes. So whereas law students are taught this in, a, in an entirely standalone module. So I created a smaller video, which is literally how to take a statute apart step by step and read it for meaning. Um, and then they can take that skill and they can then use that in any other discipline whenever they have to read statutes. So, that's, you know, that's amazing. And, so, and this isn't something you probably would have done prior to lockdown. Not at all. Um, right. Not at all. So this is it, it literally I mean, it, I won't lie. It did take me pretty much the whole of last Friday because I, I practiced with it and I worked through it and I, you know, uh, almost workshopped myself through it. Um, and then I broke it down into various subsections. Um, do you want me to show it to you quickly? Yeah. And I mean, the upside of having spent that time is now you've got it. And hopefully well, that, it will be good enough for a, a good number of years. Well, that's the thing. So I, yeah, um, oh, I'm not sharing your screen. And my apologies. Sorry, I forgot. Um, and then so. I'm going to keep part of it to give other people a chance to you ask questions and respond. Whoops. Yes, anyone else? Okay, I'm going to share screen. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so this is just a Q&A about solvency and liquidity, learning outcomes, fine. And then breaking that down into how to read law. So this the fact that it actually speaks to a theoretical approach. So it's not just a case of reading, it's about reading for meaning, so, or, you know, grammatical approaches, purposive approaches, bill of rights, etc. Giving an example of Latin. So, and then I literally broke it up. So, how to decode the structure, and then so what each one, each word, each letter would mean. Um, I'll quickly run through it. Then I just took a picture of the applicable section, which is section four for our purposes. And then on the right hand side, I literally broke it up into key words. So what they should look for. And then I literally took 4.1. And then I said within 4.1, these are the tests that, so in other words, what it's actually asking you for. And then I said, what you should be asking yourself is this little question. And I put the question at the bottom. And then I took it even further. And then I said, in, in order to read it, 
these are the steps. So section four, subsection one gives you your purpose. What is this about? But then you break it down into the following steps in order to apply it. And then I went even further. <laughs> and then I said that sometimes a step requires you to reread something. And then I gave them tips as well as an exercise with a practical scenario and then I, why it was so important. So that's what I then did this morning. Sure, Abe. So I just, just before I really stop talking, I just want to say that for me, that is such a good example of your trying to make the literacy of your discipline and your profession much more explicit to students. You're not expecting them to just have somehow through some process of osmosis learned how to read these, these kinds of documents. You are no, actually fact, teaching them. No, in fact, I actually, I mean, what I actually told them is if you are struggling with this now, that is entirely normal. It's not, and I also tell them quite frankly, it's, it's often, it's not you. <laughs> in this instance, it might actually be our fault because lawyers are actually write really badly and most legislation is very poorly drafted. So if, you know, and then unpacking it and tearing it apart that way, hopefully helps them so that they have acquired a new skill that they can use. Definitely. Nicola, do you want to take over? Not to worry, Lynn. Thank you. So I had an idea because I think this is, could be relevant to law students at other universities as well. You could share that interesting scaffolding resource you've developed as an open educational resource. Um, okay. Yeah. You can contact uh, Debbie Martindale at the library and or Vainant, uh, and yeah, they, then you basically set it up. Uh, um, they upload it as a fixed share resource because you're not using any images in that uh, presentation no. that are, you know, so very, it's something that can be very easily shared. Um, okay. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'm very happy to do that because I, I find that I think that's what's putting people off. Um, you know, and, and uh, people build a wall before they've even really approached it. And, and unfortunately, I think that was the thing with teaching in the class uh, is that we just go through, okay, we need to finish this topic. We're moving on to the next one. No hands are up. Everyone understands. Um, and then the assessment comes along and why didn't you understand such a simple thing? The text is in the, is in the statute. Um, whereas no one actually taught them how to actually unpack it and use it as a resource. So um, thank you for that. It's a pleasure, Shirai. When I see Lynn's got a question, are there any other resources of this nature that you could make for your students? Um, I've actually started to do that now. So I've taken some of the, um, I mean, depend uh, that, you know, around and bringing in various examples. So just to also say that the, this isn't so, you, the problems that you're facing aren't so unique to your particular discipline. Um, because within the law faculty or the, you know, within the legal discipline, it might often be said, well, why are we using Latin? Um, and I say, well, obviously it's, be it's because it actually helps avoid confusion um, and ambiguity um, because it is universal in that sense. And that often has a huge impact on cost um, because it's when you have confusion and you have ambiguity that you have litigation. Um, and then, you know, th that creates further inequalities. Um, whereas, of course, if we have a scenario like, and then you can compare that to medicine. So, you know, somebody could be coming from, uh, it doesn't matter, um, you know, uh, Mauritius, they could be speaking French, what, what have you, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter because the actual discipline is so universal. Um, and that, that is the key thing that I, I really wanted to first drive home to the students. Well, I think they're fortunate that you have had these insights and are, are thinking of different ways of supporting them. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, well done, Shoei. Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate it. Um, Hi, Zaza. Yes, we're going yes, to definitely yes. share the presentation. Um, yeah, any further questions, colleagues? I wondered, actually, Shoei, how did you go about choosing the students for that competition? I imagine it was a difficult choice. 
It's um, it always is. Um, uh, we 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 actually start off with a um a question. So we I'll make something up, and I'll um, it might be on the topic of subsidies and countervailing measures. And then they would have to go and research what subsidies would be. So there would be a question. So it would be so that part of it is almost like an assignment task. Um, but then the second component would be the fact that they would have to speak to it. So there, it would almost be a bit of an interview. And then I would then have to ask them questions about subsidies and countervailing measures and how that would relate to say X, Y, and Z um, that they would have to have researched. So then I can test their ability to think on their feet, how they respond to questions, um, whether or not they show deference, uh, whether or not they have the appropriate use and skill of the correct terminology. Um, because that is what they're also going to be examined on when they actually enter into not only practice, but also within the competition. Because there is the written part, which counts for about 30% of the mark. And then the 70% is actually um, for the oral component. But because this is a team, um, it, the, 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 the calculation of the marks is aggregated. So just because you could have one exceptional person, if that person so, uh, like throws the rest of the team under the bus, it actually works against the team. So you have to really work towards creating a very solid unit that relies on one another. So, um, and that's what we have to do in practice. Yeah, um, that's what I was going to say. That's how it works in any legal team it, that you're working. One person can derail everything. So it reinforces, reinforces, reinforces the practice. So that's why I said it's, it, it, for me, it is the expression of practice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they truly do, it is a completely different student that comes out of this at the end, a completely different person. Um, and many of them are, are truly inspired by this and then um, thankfully have gone on to, to do fantastic things. Shuev, I've been reading a book by Paul Ashwin, a new one, and he talks yes. about the purposes, the purposes of higher education is to transform students so that they, they become different and they can do different things in the world. And for me, this is what you absolutely are, are aiming for. You know, it's not, it's not just be pre preparing them to be whatever, you know, it's, it's that they, they change, they're actually transformed by the knowledge and the learning. So that's really great. Thank you very much, Lynn. I think that's definitely part of the, it's, it's it very, very much built into the goal of how I try to, to work with, with students. Um, uh, sounds like you may be assessing soft skills. Yes, I am assessing soft skills. Um, uh, it can't be done in an exam. And that's, that's, um, it's also part of the critical feedback that um, we give, um, what well, I give when um, I, I'm assessing students um, in, a, in an oral perspective, but it's definitely part of what is what has to be marked. So I have had a situation, for example, unfortunately, I won't mention the year or the name of the students, but where I'd be, like I said, it's a marathon. So they, you know, we're exhausted by the end of this, by now they know the panelists. Um, and the panelists, you know, was a bit naughty, but kept asking quite a probing and difficult question, which the student felt that they had already answered. And they literally just let, they broke character a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they little did, they just, they let it slip. Um, and, you know, and, and, and marks were penalized for that because one has to show deference and respect to the panel. After so that all these- That was a big learning that, curve for that yeah, student. But, Yes, and, and they learned that lesson the hard way and also because it also penalizes the team. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, and it has very material consequences for your client because, I mean, we're talking about potentially, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars. That's the arena that they're operating mm -hmm. in. So, oh, what um, an I mean, it must be grueling, but what a privilege to be part of that kind of experience for those students. Yeah, I think, I mean, all, you know, all things being equal, we have, we anticipate we will still be virtual next year, but we hope by July that at least the students will be able to attend the final rounds in person in Geneva. Um, because what I do when that happens, another part of me kicks in, then I set up meetings and interviews um, so they can go in and um, in effect, 
um, go in with their CVs and meet law firms and they can attend uh, and apply for the internships. So there are parallel sessions during the breaks that I schedule so that they can perhaps, you know, work on their, well, not perhaps, so that they can actually strategically work on their careers if they want to work within international trade. Um, and so, you know, and that has benefited students in the past where they were pretty much headhunted from this particular kind of project. Sure, that's amazing. And now that you're going to be doing it with a, with a larger class, there's also going to be a bit more kind of equity. Yes, in, exactly. In terms of the learning. So it's not only the privileged few who've had that experience, you're going to be broadening it. I, I will say, though, the, 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 the plus side is that the, having worked with smaller groups and having done it a few times now that has given and that I've built rep, you know, a reputation amongst my colleagues um, in the field, um, you know, having inherited this project uh, as a legacy project, I think now it will make it much easier. I mean, my colleagues in Switzerland are, are offering their time to give online sessions to the trade law class at Rhodes for free. Absolutely. So that's amazing. I, yeah, so that's a 2021 in that instance is looking up. So I'm already positive about that. Um, I was chatting to Nicola earlier about the fact that I'm already planning my, 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 my year for that perspective. So I think that's going to be good for them. Have you got the chat open? Yes, I see. It seems like professional bodies still have value in sit down exams. Yes, they do. There's commentary about this. We're having critique at the moment, um, saying that um, Bob Azar, um, that, um, you know, and that firms are very hesitant and are nervous about uh, employing, you know, students that haven't sat for sit down exams. Um, and that is a real concern. Um, but that's also because I think they're not necessarily sure about how the teaching um, has taken place um, across the country in terms of the field, um, but also that the legal profession tends to be quite slow to turn in mm. terms of, um, you know, it uh, evolving in itself. I mean, COVID-19 forced um, lawyers into a completely different space. And then they realized, wow, we can actually do this we might be dressed in our robes um, and everyone's in chambers, but you know, the, the cases are still being heard, motion court was still being heard, um, affidavits and what have you could be dealt with, court processes could still go ahead. And that was at the height of COVID-19. So um, I think that the profession there is definitely open to evolution. I think it's still nervous about what the outcome of the, well, of the students will be in terms of their learning um, as a consequence. Um, I think the barometer about, you know, whether or not all the assessments are of equal value or weight or have, I suppose, been thought through um, and implemented uh, well enough across the board is a different question. So, um, that is a, that is a legitimate concern, I think, for the, for the, for the profession. Yeah, most definitely. Eh? Wow. But it's so fascinating to see, you know, even how the legal profession had to adapt in the, these difficult times. Um, any other comments or questions, colleagues? Just to say thanks to Shueb, I really, I'm so pleased I made the suggestion. You contact Nicola. I'm so pleased you followed up and I'm so sorry I nearly missed it. No, well, thank you very reading. much. I was busy reading that new book I got my hands on and lost <laughs> track of the time. So thank that you very much, everyone. I, I enjoyed it very much. And thanks to Nicola for setting it all up. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. Yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> it's not really fascinating to hear how colleagues in different um, disciplines have been responding, uh, not just to the pandemic and in their field, but also, you know, the implications for teaching and learning. Yeah, and how innovative you've been. So thanks so much, Shoeb, for sharing with us today. And yeah, thank you, colleagues, for joining and hope you'll keep well and best of luck for your term for teaching.
Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Shoaib. I said I hope bye -bye. to see you face to face sometime soon. Yes, definitely. Table Thank you. you. When they open up, we'll be the first ones there. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Take care. Well, bye, bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Nicola. Cheers.